Sebastian Piers Carey, Viscount Carvel. You are here charged on the first count with theft, contrary to Section 1 of the Theft Act 1968. In that you, on the 18th of November 1973, at Shotley Hall, Hatford, in the county of Cheshire, stole $250,000 in notes, the property of Lady Carvel. How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Sebastian Piers Carey, Viscount Carvel, you are here charged on the second count with theft, contrary to Section 1 of the Theft Act 1968, in that you, on the 18th of November 1973, at Shotley Hall, Hepford, in the county of Cheshire, did aid and abet, counsel and procure persons unknown to steal $250,000 in notes, the property of Lady Carvel. How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Mr. Fry. <laughs> Lady Hermione Josephine Carvel. What is your religion? Church of England. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Hermione Josephine Carvel of Shotley Hall, Hatford. Yes. And the mother of the defendant. Yes. Are you appearing to testify in this case willingly, Lady Carvel? Yes, you I am. So? Lady Carvel, will you tell the court what happened on the afternoon of the 16th of November last year? You mean the delivery of the note? If you would. Um, well, I saw someone whom I didn't recognize coming up the drive. This was at Shotley Hall? Yes. I was in the music room overlooking the drive. I presumed it was one of the gardeners, and then my maid, Crema, brought me in a note. May the witness be shown exhibit one. Is that the note, Lady Carvel? Yes, it is. Lord, I think this might be an appropriate moment for the jury to examine it. Yes. And I shall read it. Madam. Your son, Sebastian Carvel, was kidnapped at one o'clock today. He will be killed at ten o'clock on the day after tomorrow unless we receive a quarter of a million dollars at a time and place that will be specified to you. Inform no one on pain of your son's life. Every step you make is watched. Signed, N. Swart, the KLF. KLF? The KwaZulu Liberation Front, my lord, a militant political organization aimed at the elimination of white rule in South Africa. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this must have been a shock. A great shock. Were you alone at the time? Yes, I was. Uh, did deception or anything of that nature ever occur to you, Lady Carver? I didn't follow you. Well, did it occur to you that it might have been in the nature of a practical joke? On the part of my son? Yes. Well, no. I see. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brown. Shortly after the delivery of this note, you received a telephone call, did you not? Uh, yes. Was it to do with this kidnap? Yes, it was. Would you tell the court roughly what the caller said? Well, they wanted to be sure that I had received the note, that I understood it. They told me that my son was safe and that I must get the money. And then at the end of the call, uh, he said, I'm from Joburg myself. Did this mean anything to you? Well, yes, it did. My husband's family had a controlling interest in a gold mine outside uh, Johannesburg up until the early 20s. I see. So this person knew something of your history. Well, evidently. Uh, did it not occur to you in all this time to go to the police, Lady Carver? Well, no. I didn't want to put my son's life in danger. Could you not have telephoned? Well, I thought that if I did, the police would arrive and, and, and be seen. And also, I had the extraordinary notion that... Uh, well, I've since been told this is quite impossible, that these people could have tapped my telephone. But you did go to the police eventually, did you not? Yes. After it was dark, I sent a note by my cook's son to Detective Inspector Grant, yes, whom yes. I had met on some previous occasion. I asked him on no account to come to the hall, but to meet me at my bank the following morning in London. I asked him to go alone and to arrive alone. Did you tell the bank manager that the police would be there? No, no. I just asked him to have the money ready. I wanted it in dollars, and I wanted it suitably packed. 
before you set off for London, you received another telephone call from the kidnappers, did you not? Yes, I did. When was this? At nine o'clock the following morning. They asked me if I wanted to speak to my son. Of course, I said I did. I heard my son's voice pleading with me for the money. He sounded very frightened. It was very humiliating. Now, Lady Carver, was the quality of your son's voice the same as that of the other person that you spoke to? No, no, it was different. It was quieter and it was, well, it was metallic. I really can't think of a better word. Did you speak to him? Uh, well, I was told very emphatically not to, but I, I tried to. I had to. To help him? Well, I asked him how he was. And More than once? Uh, well, yes, I kept repeating myself at least three times. Did he reply? No. Did he appear to pause and listen to what you were saying? No, no. His voice is one continuous stream? Yes. I should like at this point, my lord, to introduce exhibit two. This is a cassette of tape, magnetic recording tape, which is, as we heard earlier from Detective Inspector Grant, was found in the back of an abandoned car thought to have been used by the burglars in their flight. If my learned friends has no objections, I'd like to play this to the court now. No objections, my lord. Very well, Mr. Fry. Lady Carvel, I'd like you to listen to this and then tell us whether it is similar to what you heard on the telephone on the morning of the 17th of November last. Mother, Mother, listen. They won't let me talk for long. These men are desperate. I don't know what they're asking, but give it to them. They're going to kill me. I know they're going to kill me. Help me, please. back at Shotley Hall, what did you do with the money? I went into the library and put it in the safe. It's disguised as part of the bookshelf. It's one of those really rather clever things. At what time was this? At ten to seven. Can you be precise about that? Oh yes, I can be exact. You see, my train arrived at 6.28. It takes 12 minutes to get from the station to the hall, and then by the time I had got into the library and put the money in the safe, it was as near 10 to 7 as really makes no difference. And then, uh, then I received the telephone call. Now, you were expecting this telephone call, Yes, I, I was, but not as early as this. When had you been told to expect it? Between 8 and 9. So it was an hour earlier than anticipated? Yes, it was. Now, in order to take this telephone call, did you have to leave the library? Yes, I did. There is no telephone in the library? No. Uh, was this call a lengthy one? Yes, it was. How long? Well, it was about half an hour. Well, did it seem to you to be unnecessarily long? Yes, it did. Did the caller appear to be playing for time? Well, my lord, this is very tedious. Evidently, this witness cannot possibly answer that. Question. Yes, I quite agree. Very good, my lord. After the telephone call, did you then get in touch with Detective Inspector Grant? Yes, I did. And what did you tell him? I told him I was being collected with the money at 11 o'clock and being taken to my son. And were you collected then? No. Why not? Because my son returned. You must have been very surprised, Lady Carvel. Well, I was so relieved, I, I could hardly feel anything else. How long was it before you thought to look in the safe to see if the money was still there? Oh, well, I thought it uh, just a few minutes, but uh, my son's wrists were tied together. We had, of course, to release him. And then did you look? Uh, I was prevented. Physically? No, no, no. I was distracted. I see now that I was purposely distracted. What did your son say? He said, oh, blast the money. And uh, then later on when I went to go towards the safe, he stopped me, pretended to embrace me and uh, asked me to get him a drink. But you did eventually look in the safe? Yes, I did. And what did you find? Nothing. The money had been taken. How did your son react when you found that the money had gone? He said, the bastards. He repeated it several times, but without very much conviction. He didn't suggest that you should get in touch with the police immediately? Oh, no, no, no. And did you think to get in touch with the detective, Inspector Grant? Yes, but Sebastian, well, my son was very, very unwilling to do so. Uh, he said he didn't want the police crawling all over the house the first night he was back. And then I told him that they were outside and waiting. How did he react to that? He went white. He went the color of chalk. He said, out there, they're waiting out there. I have very rarely seen my son frightened, and never as frightened as this. Of course, I didn't understand it at the time. Did he calm down? 
Yes, yes, I, I gave him another drink. What was he drinking, Lady Garvel? Whiskey and water. Was this normal for him? Oh, yes, mm. yes. Lady Carvel, you've told us that your son was all oh, that is that he returned at about eight o'clock. Can you remember what he said to you when you first met? He said, I'm back. How did he seem to you? Oh, well, he was excited, he was nervous, he kept looking at me, he kept watching me. He was watching me to see if I suspected anything. He kept looking into my face to see if I really believed him. Did he say anything else? Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, yes, he... He showed me a cut on his forehead. It was really nothing very serious at all. And this is very extraordinary because my son is impervious to pain. On his 21st birthday, he fractured two ribs while falling in a hunt, but insisted on continuing with the hunt. And here he was, wittering on about some trivial little scratch. So it was you who eventually got in touch with Detective Inspector Grant. Yes. Lady Carvel, your son is a postgraduate student at Hove University, is he not? Yes, he is. Did you at any time during the last summer vacation have a conversation with him on the subject of money? Yes, I did. Did he want some money? Yes, he asked to have some money released from the family trust. How much did he ask for? Well, he wasn't awfully forthcoming at the time. It was something in the region of £50,000. £50,000? Did he say what he wanted it for? <laughs> yes, he said he wanted to finance a newspaper or a magazine. What sort of magazine? I really don't know, and he wouldn't give me any reasons. I was uh, very anxious about it. I didn't like the sound of it, so I referred him to our family solicitor, Sir Geoffrey Tyrone, and said that if he thought it was advisable and fell within the provisions of the family trust, well, then all well and good. And there did you let the matter rest? Yes, I did. And your son never mentioned the subject again? No. I have no more questions, my lord. Thank you, Lady Carvel. Um, <coughs> Lady Carvel, I would like to clarify. I would like you to clarify for me one or two points regarding the internal arrangements of rooms at Shotley Hall. It is apparently in this case, and I don't think this will be disputed by the defence, that the thieves hid for some time in one of the attics. Uh, yes. How many attics are there in Shotley Hall? Well, this was a disused attic. Uh, some of them are used as storerooms, some of them as bedrooms for the servants. There are, in fact, um, two disused attics. I think it would be helpful in view of the many matters relating to the precise layout of rooms at Shortley Hall if plans could be made available for the court tomorrow. Oh, with pleasure, my lord. Thank you. Yes, proceed, Mr. Parsons. My lord. Lady Carver, it's a tragic sight to see a mother testifying against her one and only son. Yes. Hmm. Well, Lady Carvel, it is not part of the defence's case to dispute the fact that there was a kidnapping or that there was a robbery. If only we had the thieves here. If only, but there we haven't. And I'm sure you would have liked some of your money to return to, but there it hasn't been. So we haven't got the thieves and we haven't got the money but we must just get on as well as we can without them. Mr. Parsons, if you have no questions for this witness, have I your permission to release her? <laughs> I won't keep her long, my lord, if you'll bear with me. Uh, Lady Carver, you said continually during your testimony that you were alone in the house or the hall during your audio. Yes. It gave to your predicament an added poignancy. It was not in fact the case that there were several servants in the house at the time. Yes. So you were not alone? Well, apart from the servants, I was alone. Oh. Well, um, how many servants have you, Lady Carvel? House servants? Yes. Eight. Eight. Nine, including the chauffeur. Oh. Nine. And gardeners, how many gardeners? Two. And a boy. And a boy. And you have a groom? Yes. One? Yes. And an estate manager? Yes. So, two, four, nine. Well, there's 13 people and a boy who are habitually associated with the Shotley Hall, apart from yourself and Lord Carvel. You could say so. I could say so, and I have said so, Lady Carvel. You see, a great deal has been made by the prosecution of the fact that the thieves appear to have known about the internal layout of the hall, and I am rather concerned that the jury may have gained the impression 
that the only person who knew about the internal layout, apart from yourself, was Lord Carville. But that isn't so, is it? Well, I hardly think the gardeners would be very familiar with the inside of the house. But might they not be familiar with one of the servants who was familiar with the internal layout? Yes, it's And do possible. you not sometimes have guests in your house who are also familiar with the internal layout? Your well, nice line of questioning is taking a singularly tasteless and irrelevant turn. How my learned friend can think that insinuations against Lady Carvel's personal friends are relevant is beyond me. I'm merely trying to establish that there are many, many people familiar with the internal layout of Shotley Hall and from whom information could have been attained apart from Lord Carvel. My learned friend need not be so sensitive. Any suggestion of complicity in, with these people was far from the uh, bounds of my intentions. Yes, I think you have succeeded in making your point, Mr. Parsons. I'm sure that the jury will appreciate that Lady Carvel and her son were not the only people with knowledge of the house. Thank, Thank you, my Lord. Lord. Mm. Now, Lady Carvel, your son returned, did he not, at about eight o'clock? Yes. And you immediately suspected that he was implicated in this plot? Oh, no, not immediately. Oh. Have I misunderstood you? Uh, well, I I'm mean, sorry. Uh, did you not say in your testimony that he was uh, distracting you when you wanted to look in the safe? Oh, yes, he did. And you said that he pretended, he pretended to embrace that's you. That's correct. And then asked for a drink to prevent you looking in the safe. Yes, that's right. Well, in the light of all this suspicious behaviour, you surely must have suspected him. But not at the time. Lady Carvel, if these things were not suspicious at the time, how is it they have become so suspicious since? Well, in the light of other evidence, there were other things that ah. made it other evidence. But Lady Carvel, you are on oath as to your evidence, and I suggest to you that at the time your son's behaviour was not suspicious. I have said it wasn't. Precisely. And it was not suspicious because it was not suspicious. But it was. I realised it all. Lady Carvel, you have told us that your son complained of a scratch in spite of the fact you know he's impervious to pain. You have told us in graphic details how that when you said the police were outside, he turned the colour of chalk. Now, Lady Carvel, I suggest to you that these things are either suspicious or they are not suspicious. They are not manifestations that become suspicious through the alchemy of time, surely. Surely. When everything else started falling into place, I realised how suspicious his behaviour had been. Let's see. Now, Lady Carvel, before this affair, how good was your relationship with your son? Very good. Really? Yes. When your son comes to you for help, financial or otherwise, is it then your habit to tell him to apply to the family solicitor? No. But that is what you told us you did when he asked for some money during his summer vacation. Well, it was a very considerable sum. Well, indeed, but it was, after all, eventually to be his own, was it not? Was it not, yes. Lady Carver? Yes, it was. Therefore, I would like to know if, as you say, you were on good terms with your son at this time, why you referred his request for money, which was to all intents and purposes his own, to the family solicitor. Prior to this request, my son had had a friend, a university friend, to stay with him. He was and he may still be deeply involved with this woman. And in my opinion, she had a very unhealthy effect upon him. And I suspected that it was she who was behind this request for money and that he wasn't being truthful about his reasons for wanting it. Hmm. Well, uh, did you think we were going to elope? <laughs> no. Well, why did you why did you suspect he wanted this money? I don't know why he wanted it. I only suspected this woman was behind it, and that's all I can say. Well, I hope not, Lady Carvel. I mean, was your son having a were the um oh, was she his mistress, do you think? Very likely. What well, do you think she was? Yes, I do. And did you disapprove? Yes, of course I did. I've already said she had a very bad effect upon him. What was the name of this woman? 
Amaryllis Roper. Is she to appear as a witness in this case? No, not for the prosecution, my lord. My lord, it's the first mention I've heard of this name. Well, did you, uh, did you mention this woman to the police? No, no, I didn't. But did you not suspect that she might have been involved in this crime, believing, as you have said you did, that she was behind your son's earlier request for money? But it was just a feeling I had. I really had no grounds for my suspicions, and it's not something I wanted to have mentioned at all. Yes, I see. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Parson. My lord. Um, so, Lady Carvel, you thought uh, this woman... Um, Amaryllis Roper was your son's mistress. Yes, I did. Now, was she the first mistress your son had ever had? I don't know. Well, in that case, she was the first that you were aware of. Yes. Yes, and she was uh, taking your son away from you. Did you feel that, Lady Carver? No, no, not particularly. Oh, come, come, Lady Carver. Your husband had been dead for 12 years now. All your love and devotion had devolved upon your son the heir to the Carvel. Lord, I object. What possible relevance have Lady Carvel's feeling for a woman who is in no way concerned in this case? Every possible relevance. We must not forget in our sympathy for Lady Carvel the prejudicial effect where a mother willingly testifies against her son. Now, if the motive for giving this testimony is in any way tainted by other feelings or considerations other than those that bear directly on this case, it is only proper that these other feelings and considerations are thoroughly exposed. I wish you'd be more precise, Mr. Parsons. What is it you're suggesting? I'm suggesting that Lady Carvel, and indeed I put it to you now, Lady Carvel, for your earnest consideration, I'm suggesting that you are plagued with the suspicion that this woman, Miss Roper, is plotting with your son, a quite ground a suspicion, as you yourself have said, and it is your fear, dislike, and indeed hatred of this woman that has now turned you against your own son, and none of the considerations you have already mentioned. No, that is not true. No further questions, my lord. Thank you, Lady Carvel. Lady Carvel, when she was with you, did this woman, Amaryllis Roper, Express any political views? Yes, oh, yes, she did. I object. What has Miss Roper's political views got to do with this case? Well, since there's a political element in the case, of course it's relevant. My learned friend cannot have it all his own way. Only a moment ago he was asking me the relevance of Lady Carvel's views and the lady who had nothing to do with this case. And I freely confess that Lady Carvel's feelings for this woman continued to elude me. On the other hand, the political opinions of someone who we may assume was a prime influence upon oh, the accused come, 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 are of the we utmost importance. So of course we may assume Those so gentlemen. much. Those gentlemen! Let's have no more of this. It would be interesting. It might be relevant to know whether any mention of politics was made during Miss Roper's visit. I take it it is Miss Roper? I believe so. Yes, well, there may be political aspects to this case, whether we like it or not. Now, as this is new evidence, I will allow you to cross-examine on it, Mr. Parsons, if you so wish. My lord. Yes, Mr. Frank? Thank you, my lord. Now, Lady Carvel, did your son and this girl, Amaryllis Roper, discuss politics? Did you ever hear them? Yes. Were you present yes. when they did, sir? Yes, yes, I did. And, and sometimes they seemed to discuss nothing else. Now, would you say that Miss Roper was left-wing? Yes, extremely. Did you ever hear her mention the KLF? Yes, I did. Can you remember what she said on those occasions? Well, uh, she didn't just discuss that organisation. She talked about South Africa, the British Empire in general, and she had the impertinent idea that our family business success was based on the exploitation of the blacks in South Africa. Yes? And she had the effrontery at dinner one evening to actually attack me about this. The case of the Queen against Carvel will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. Yesterday in the Crown Court, Lady Hermione Carvel gave evidence about the theft from her safe of $250,000 in notes. In the dock is her son, Sebastian Lord Carvel, accused both of the theft and of aiding and abetting the theft.
At yesterday's hearing, Defence Counsel Mr Jeremy Parsons, QC, sought to prove that Lady Carvel may have been biased against her son by her dislike of his mistress, Amaryllis Roper. Mr Jonathan Fry, QC, for the prosecution, alleged, however, that Miss Roper may have influenced the accused to commit the theft for political reasons. He's now called a forensic scientist to the witness box to give expert opinion on evidence found at the scene of the crime. Mr Justice Michener presides in the case of the Queen against Carvel. I am Charles Raymond Ing of number two Grove Close, Triton. I am director of the Trafalgar Police Laboratory. I have an honors degree in chemistry and 32 years' experience in the field in which I'm about to give evidence. Mr. Ng, a lot of your evidence, as I understand it, is not disputed by the defense in this case, but I know the court would be grateful if you'd take us through certain points for clarification, if nothing else. So I'll believe that when I see it. Mr. Ng? I see, I'll believe it's not disputed when I see it. <laughs> Well, now, you were contacted by Detective Inspector Grant on the 19th of November, 1973, and asked to go to Shotley Hall, Hapford, to make a report, were you not? Yes. yes. When you got there... The scenes of the crime, officer, Mr. Canning contacted me, actually, but that's correct, yes. Yes, of course. Now, would you describe what you found on the inside of the house? Uh, Lord, in response to your request, the prosecution have now produced a plan of the relevant parts of the house, which is an agreed document. Yes, I have it here. Could the witness be shown the plan, please? Go. Now, Mr. Ink, <coughs> did you find any footprints inside the house that appeared to have been made by the thieves? Oh, yes, yes. We had a, a bit of a field day here. You see, the thieves got in through a window at the back of the house. Now, in the kitchen, they were wearing gloves, I would say, because there were no fingerprints, but in the passage outside the kitchen, there were some clear footprints. Now, the floor of the kitchen is paved with flagstones, and there's very little one can say about that, except that whoever swept them <laughs> did a good job. But in the passage outside the kitchen, there were some clear footprints leading into the main hall, up the main stairs, along this passage here, to the back stairs, right up into the attic. Did you find any signs that they'd gone into any of the rooms on the way up? No, not on the way up, no. Would you have expected to find signs if they had done so? Yes, uh, you would expect to. So they'd gone straight, unhesitatingly, to the attic? Apparently, yes. Mm. How many of them were there, do you think? Three. Now, there always did appear to be three, but once we got down to examining the prints in the attic room, it was absolutely certain that there were three. Thank you, Asha. Would you now tell us what you found in the attic? Oh, yes. We had uh, a bit of luck with this room. I have some photographs. I believe you have copies. Yes, yes. Now, here we have prints A and B. Bare boards, you see. Bare boards. The rooms are very seldom entered, so there's a thin layer of fine dust over the whole thing, you see. And really some very fine prints. These were taken by my colleague. Uh, not police photographs. Oh, no, 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 they were taken by my colleague. Oh. Taken from the vertical and the oblique. You see the angles from which they're taken. Now, then we have prints C and D, a pair left and right, probably plimpsels, you see a mark left by what appears to be a drawing pin in this one. And then we have prints E and F, a third pair, not quite as good, clear here, but as far as one can see, a pair, not as good as the plimsolls. Far more wear. You see the plimsolls, probably almost new. And then, finally, we have prints G and H, a third pair, very clear indeed, excellent prints, probably tennis shoes. Would the jury... Well, could the jury be shown copies, please? Yes. This will be exhibit five. Yes. Lord. If there are any questions you'd like to ask me, don't hesitate. Yes, well, Mr. Ing, the pair C and D matches the shoes found in the back of the abandoned car. Oh, yes, you mean the pair of... 
black plumes. Yes, could we have those, please? That's exhibit uh, three. Yes. Now, here we have a brand new pair of shoes. Almost brand new. Hardly anywhere. And I would say they are the pair of shoes shown in prints C and D. You see the drawing pin in the sole of this one. Uh, do you have any difficulty in seeing from... Well, the drawing will be shown in the exhibit in a moment. Now, I was certain that these are the shoes that made the prints C and D that were found in the attic. Oh, yes, I am. The odds against them being different uh, with the drawing pin and all are... Uh, and, and this is mathematical, mind you, in the region of or 10 to the power of 8, about 100 million to 1. I see. Now, in addition to the prints, you also made a microscopic examination of the plimsolls, did you not? I did, yes. Would you tell us what you found? Yes, well, I examined the canvas and the inner soles of the shoes for sweat, which was grouped, and also for fibres. I found black nylon fibres evidently coming from the socks worn by whoever was wearing the shoes. The sweat was group A. And I believe you also examined a nylon mask for Sir Diamond yes. Traces. This is exhibit four, my lord. Yes. And you found? Yes. Hairs. Oh, no, 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 I mean the saliva. What group was it? Oh, uh, group A, uh, same as the plimsolls. And have you analysed a sample of the defendant's blood? I have, and it is group A, yes. Oh, Mr. Ng, I wonder if you would explain for the jury about these groups. Oh, yes, certainly, my lord. It's very simple. A child could understand it. Uh, you see, uh, the blood of human beings is divided into groups. O, A, B, A, B. Now, this is very well known. I, uh, I'm sure you all know it. But, but what is not so generally known is that this also relates to saliva, sweat, and... and sweat, yes. There is also what is known as a non-excreta, but uh, since we're not involved with one in this case, we... Very clear. Thank you, Mr. A. Yes, Mr. Brown. So we can say without any doubt that whoever wore the stocking mask, whoever found the plimsolls that were found in the back of the abandoned car was of the same blood group as the defendant. Oh, yes, there's no doubt about that. Thank and that whoever wore the plimsolls had also been in the attic. Almost certainly, yes. Yes. Now, you were about to tell us just now about some other traces you found on the stocking mask. I'm afraid I rather rudely interrupted you. Perhaps you could tell us. Yes, we found five samples of the same hair... Black, short, slight kink. Black hair? Yes. And have you compared those samples with samples of the defendants? Yes, I have, and I could find no way to distinguish them. To what extent is it possible to distinguish one human hair from another? Well, human hair is not unique, not like fingerprints, but if I had a single hair from everyone in this courtroom, I am certain that I would be able to appropriate it to its rightful owner. <laughs> I'm darn sure I could. And you would attribute the hair on this mask to the defendant? Well, since there is also saliva from his group on the mask, I would say yes, probably. And it isn't just because of the hair, you understand. It's also the medulla, what we call the root, skin around the root, uh, traces of dandruff. Oh, I, I don't want to be personal. You know. Yes, yes, I, I would say yes. yes. You would not accept it as coincidental? No, 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 I wouldn't, no. Thank you, Mr. Ng. No more questions, Lord. Mr. Ng, whilst appreciating your great experience and skill, there are areas of your testimony that quite take my breath away. If you look around this courtroom and you say you could confidently attribute a hair to its rightful owner, but there are only what... 30 or 40 people in this courtroom, Mr. Ng. There are 64 million people in the United Kingdom. Would you be quite so happy with such a large sample? No, 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 no. I see all that. Uh, what I meant I was that... I know what you mean, Mr. Ng, but is not a black hair simply a black hair? I mean, wouldn't all the black hairs in this courtroom prove to be much of a muchness? Yes, yes. Now, what percentage of the population falls into this Group A, Mr. Ng. About uh, 42%. My information is 44%, but we won't quibble about that. 42%. That is, should we agree, it would be um, 28 million people. Yes, but not male black hair. No, 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 no. We are talking about blood group A, Mr. Ng. 
Yes. Yes, I'm merely trying to clarify what you yourself have said. That 44%, 42%, when almost half the population falls into this category. Yes, well. Yes, good. Now, Mr. Ng, what colour of socks are you wearing today? Black. Black, yes. So am I. And so was the defendant on the night in question. And so was whoever wore the plimsolls, which you so rightly pointed out, were in the attic, on the feet of the criminal in the night in question. Now, the coincidence is surely verging on the commonplace, Mr. A. Yes, but you're not taking into account... No, Mr. Ng, what I'm trying to point out to you is we have a black plimsoll which made, or probably made, a set of prints in the attic. Now, we're not disputing that. Let's be quite clear, the defence does not dispute that. But that the defendant wore those plimsolls, that we dispute. Now, let us look at the information you've given us. Um, sweat on the inside lining, belonging to the second most common group there is, 44% of 42 the percent. Yes, well, 44 is my figure. 44% of the population. Fibre from a black sock, the most common colour worn by men in this country. Do you know what percentage of men habitually wear black socks, Mr. Ng, of the male adult population. <laughs> I have to be a manufacturer. Well, we have it from a leading fashion advisor that uh, black is the most common colour of socks worn by the male adult population. Yeah. Now, what colour of sock would it occur to you to wear on a night operation of this sort, Mr. Ng? I mean, wouldn't black be the most natural, almost a Obligatory colour to wear. No, see, I'm only giving you no, the facts. Black be the I'm most natural. Only giving you the facts of this case. This person was wearing black socks. That's all I'm saying. Ah, you are not saying it was a defendant. No, I didn't say he was. No. No. Thank you, Mr. Ng. No further questions. Mr. Ng, my learned friend has ingeniously taken each individual part of your evidence and belittled it. To do so, however, is to misunderstand the nature of the evidence, which is cumulative, is it not? Precisely. You see, it's like this. When I do my football pools, I usually get one draw. Occasionally, I get two draws. And very rarely, I get three draws. Now, if I could get eight draws, I wouldn't be standing in this witness box giving testimony, because I'd have retired long since. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Sebastian Pierce Carey Carvel, the defendant in this case. Yes. Now, Lord Carvel, can we please get straight to the heart of this matter? Will you tell the court, in your own words, about your abduction? Yes, well, I was going to visit a friend for lunch. Uh, this would be Miss Amaryllis Roper, would it? Yes, yes. Well, I was uh, walking along the promenade by the sea. I was early, I had plenty of time to spare. The pavilion clock had just struck... Oh, no, the pavilion clock just hadn't struck one, that's right. Yes, uh, what time was your appointment? Uh, one fifteen, and it was nearby. Yes. Well, anyway, a, a car suddenly drew up, and the back door flew open, and a chap in the back asked me the way to North Street, which is a fairly main street through the centre of the town. Anyway, I leant down so that I could see him, and I was talking, and uh, well, all of a sudden what seemed like a passerby pushed me from behind. I was pulled into the car by my collar, uh, by the chap I'd been speaking to. Then I was pushed again from behind and hauled down into the seat. Uh, he had hold of my forearm. It was very quick. Anyway, he then slammed the door and uh, we drove off. Yes. It was very, very quick. Did you strike him? Well, no, I didn't. The, uh, the two men in the back both had guns. They were holding them against my ribs. Well, were you frightened? Yes, I was. Yes. Were there any other men in the car? Yes, there were two others in the front, uh, but they didn't say anything. Yes. And where were you taken? I've got to admit I didn't take all that much in. Uh, let me see now. Uh, well, we, we drove out of the town uh, and then along a sort of country road. Uh, there was a sapling wood on one side and well, on the other we drove into a field where there was a van waiting. Yes, so were there uh, other men waiting there? Yes, there were two other men. Uh, 
One of them opened the gate. It was a steel tube type gate. He, he thumped the roof of the car as we drove in. You know why? Some sort of welcome, I suppose. Yes, I see. Now, before getting out of the car, did they do anything? Yes, uh, yes, they put a sack over my head. Uh, men in the back did this. Uh, I, I didn't see the faces of the men in the front at all, although I did see the driver's eyes in the rearview mirror. It seemed to make him very nervous. He, he told me to sit further down in my seat. Yes, so uh, having had this hood put over your head, you were then transferred from the car to the back of the van. Yes, yes, well, yes. then they, they really did go to town. They tied my wrists and they tied my ankles and then they tied me to the van. Yes, I see. Now, for how long... Uh, were you travelling in the van? Very difficult to say. Well, could you say approximately? Not an awful lot of point, really, but... Uh, well, if, if I could just think what type of road we were on. Uh, well, I, I do remember there was a very long, smooth bit after the country road, almost as if it might have been a motorway. Uh, or a very good road, and then a motorway. Well, anyway, as to the time business, well, um, I would say we were in the van for more than two hours, uh, probably more than three, but... Less than, less than eight, I would think. Yes. So, after time, uh, you arrived at what was their destination. Yes. And what happened then? Well, um, I was untied, except for my wrists, and uh, taken into a house. How, how did you know it was a house? Of course, I don't, but it uh, felt like a house, and uh, had a cellar like a house, and it was warm as we went through the door. It didn't feel like a barn, it didn't feel like a cottage either, really. I don't believe cottages have cellars anyway, do they? Well, I wouldn't like to say, Lord Tom. No, and, well, barns are usually cold. Yes. Yes. Is it all right if I move on a little at this oh, point? Oh, by all means, Lord Tom. Well, I tell you what puts me right on this time business. Yes. In the cellar where I was kept prisoner, there was a grill high up in the wall. Well, perhaps I should explain that when they first put me in there, they took my hood off. So I could tell through this grill uh, that it was dark outside. Well, that means I was probably in the van for more than four and a half hours, doesn't it? What time does it get dark in November? About five, doesn't it? Um, yes, well, I mean, be that as it may, we can accept that you were in the van for well over four hours. Yes, quite. Yes. yes. Something occurs to me with all this talk of time. Did you not have a wristwatch? Yes, I did, but it was taken from me. Before this time? Yes, yes, by, by one of them. When they tied my wrist in the first place, one of them took my watch and I've not seen it since. Yes, I see. So you were kept captive in the cellar of this house for how long? Oh, the, well, the, the rest of that evening and the uh, whole of the following day. Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Parson. Yes, uh, were you secured during this time? Yes, I was. Uh, they put a pair of handcuffs on my, uh, my left wrist and secured it to, uh, to an old bed frame. Well, then they bought me some food... Uh, I imagine that's why it was my left wrist they secured and not my right one. Yes, I see. You say there was a grill through which you could see. Ah, oh, no, I, I couldn't see through it, but I could see whether it was light or dark. I see. And, and could you see around this um, uh, prison? Well, once my eyes had got accustomed to the light, should I say the dark, yes. yes. Now, were you at any time uh, molested or attacked by your captors? Oh, yes, I was. Well, I asked for it. I tried to escape, you see. Yeah, well, as I say, this, this bed, well, they secured me only by my right wrist, and I thought that Your, if I... Your, uh, left wrist, hmm? Ah, my left wrist, that's quite yeah. right, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, my left wrist, I was only attached to the bed by my left wrist. Yes. Well, anyway, this bed, I don't know how beds usually are, but uh, the spring, that is the bit in the middle, came apart from the two ends, and I managed by getting off the bed to detach the end that I was secured to from the rest of it. Well, at first, I thought I'd try walking out with it like that because I could just get it under my arm and just carry it. But the legs trailed on the floor. They made the most god-awful racket. Well, then I, then I had another idea. I put the bedhead up against the wall. Uh, you see, the bedhead had a pair of cross pieces. Now, mm. the way these cross pieces were shaped, I thought if I could uh, break one of them, I might be able to slide the handcuff down the leg and off. Anyway, I, I brought my foot up to, to kick it... Uh, well, uh, you see, it was uh, terribly rusty. I mean, the walls in that place were ringing with damp. Anyway, I, I brought my foot up to kick it. I must have hit it mm, three or four times, and it snapped. But anyway, I, I, I made the most awful noise because one of the chaps came thundering down the stairs and shouting and cursing, and he knocked me to the ground. Well, I, I was still entangled with the bed frame, so I couldn't defend myself. And Oh, he was shouting and cursing, and uh, he had a, a knife, a great big kitchen knife, and he was uh, brandishing it in front of my face. Yes, thank you, Carhu. Now, there's been some considerable speculation about the source of the criminal's 
apparent familiarity with the interior of the house. Yes. Now, Shopley Hall is open to the public from time to time, is it not? Uh, yes, yes, it was directed in my father's will that it should be open to the public at certain times of the year. Yes. And were there uh, brochures printed with plans of the interior? Oh, yes, quite detailed ones. Good. Thank you. Now, we've heard a tape recording already during this trial, which your mother has agreed is the voice she heard in the telephone. Yes, uh, that was a recording of a message they forced me to make. Now, could you tell us the circumstances of how they, of how they forced you to make this telephone call? Well, I, I, I don't know whether it was the state I was in or what. Uh, I hardly slept at all that night. Uh, well, the following morning, one of the chaps uh, brought me a cup of weak, sweet tea. He, he started talking to me. Uh, I've got to admit, he was quite impressive. Uh, he warned me that I was to cooperate. He said none of them would have any scruples about killing me. He said only the cause mattered. And then he held a gun to my temple and he said, I'd do it now if there was the slightest need. Well, uh, he said that unlike ordinary criminals, they didn't fear for their own skins. I don't know whether it was the state I was in or what, but at the time, he did seem 100% serious. Yes. It was after this that they took you to the telephone? Yes, it was, yes. They told me that I was to talk to my mother, uh, that my safety, my life depended on it, uh, depended on her, and that I was to make her realise that. Uh, well, anyway, they told me that she was being difficult and that she'd refused to get the money, and... Well, one of them again, he, he held a gun to the back of my head. He said, if you don't want your brains blown all over the wall, you'll make your mother realise that uh, she's to cooperate and get the money for us. Yes. And as we know, you did this. Well, I did, yes, but... Well, you do see why, don't you? I mean, they were afraid that I might have... Well, by some fluke, recognised one of them or realised where I was and blown the whole thing sky high with just a couple of words. Yes. Now, Lord Carver, can you tell us what happened later that evening? Get yes. Yes, certainly. Well, uh, I was taken out of the cellar. Uh, uh, my wrists were tied, and uh, I was led out to a car this time. It was dark outside. Yes, and um, before they put the hood over your head? Yes, yes. Uh, they they, they put a hood, not, not the sack, a uh, hood this time over my head. Not the stocking mask, about which I know nothing. And then they led me out to the car. Uh, were, were you in the back of this car? Yes, yes, the same as before, except that, uh, except that I wasn't tied. Yes. Anyway, as I say, we drove for one or two hours, I uh, suppose. Uh, uh, when you say you weren't tied, uh, do you mean your hands weren't tied or your feet weren't tied? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. I, I meant my wrists were tied. Yes. Just, just my wrists were tied. Anyway, we, uh, we travelled in the car for one or two hours, I suppose, very fast over winding roads. And then at the end of the journey, we crawled for what seemed like an eternity, but... I imagine it was only about 20 minutes over. What had later turned out were fields. Terribly bumpy. Yes. And what happened at the end of the journey? Ah, well, uh, then I was hauled out of the car and dragged for some distance across a field and thrown into a ditch. Well, I, I didn't dare move. Uh, but then after a while, well, I, I started to think, because it was so quiet, you see. And, well, I managed to clamber out of the ditch and I, I struggled with the hood and managed to get it off my head and... Well, nothing. <laughs> They'd all gone and left me. It was then I realised that I was in a ditch at the bottom of the field to the east of the house. And you were free? Yes, absolutely. It was all over. Well... We return for the final day's hearing in the case of the Queen against Carvel tomorrow in the Crown Court. In the case of the Queen against Carvel before Mr Justice Michener, the Crown alleges that Lord Sebastian Carvel faked his own kidnapping with a view to the theft and aiding and abetting the theft of the ransom money from his mother, Lady Carvel. 
In the course of his examination yesterday by Mr. Jeremy Parsons, QC, Lord Carville asserted that the kidnapping was genuine, and Mr. Jonathan Fry, QC, for the prosecution, is now about to cross-examine him. The defence are to call an additional witness, Miss Amaryllis Roper. Miss Roper was the accused's mistress, and it has been alleged that her political views may well have helped to alienate Lady Carville from her son. <laughs> So, you were pulled into the back of the car by two men with guns. And there were two other men in the front who didn't speak. Uh, Is that correct, Lord Carl? Yeah, yes, yes. And yet you told my learned friend that one of the men in the front, the driver, told you uh, to keep your head down. Oh, maybe he did. Uh, you see the contradiction, Lord Carvel. Did he or didn't he? I really don't remember. You've confused me. Ah. Now, this escape and captivity of yours, Lord Carvel. It really is a florid, boy's own paper sort of fantasy, isn't it? A thwarted escape, the man brandishing a carving life like some landlocked Captain Hook. The fanatical idealist to whom the cause is everything. <laughs> oh, really? Mmm, the escape. You weren't by any chance going to this luncheon engagement wearing hobnailed boots, were you? Am I to answer that? Well, perhaps you just tell the court what you were wearing at the time. I was wearing the same shoes that I was wearing on my release. Black slip-on shoes. And yet you asked the court to believe that with this lightweight shoe, you broke one of the cross bars of an iron bed frame. I've told you it was very rusty. <laughs> rusty or not, Lord Carvel. Iron is sturdy stuff. I'm sorry? It's fiction, isn't it? It's just one of those little details that litter the trails of adventure stories and simply don't bear close scrutiny. Like this man with the carving knife who thundered down the steps. That was your word, wasn't it, Lord Carvel, that he thundered down the steps? Yes. And yet you said in two statements to Detective Inspector Grant that the steps were made of concrete or stone. Now, I put it to you that one cannot thunder down stone steps. That would have required a wooden staircase, at least, wouldn't it? The noise might have been a clatter, but it would hardly have been the reverberating boom of thunder. Oh, very well, he clattered down. Unless, of course, you were never in the cellar. Unless the whole thing is fabrication, and that is why the details are full of these inconsistencies. Is that not, in fact, the case, Lord Carvel? No, it is not. Now, this, uh, this tape recording, I wonder if we could hear it again. One can sometimes be more objective at a second hearing. Mother, listen. They won't let me talk for long. These men are desperate. I don't know what they're asking, but give it to them. They're going to kill me. I know they're going to kill me. Help me, please. I, I wonder if we could hear it again. Mother, Mother listen. They won't let me talk for long. These men are desperate. I don't know what they're asking, but give it to them. They're going to kill me. I know they're going to kill me. Help me, please. If you could bear with me, my lord, I would like to hear it once again. Mr. Fryer. Mother, Mother, listen. They won't let me talk for long. These men are desperate. I don't know what they're asking, but give it to them. They're going to kill me. I know they're going to kill me. Help me, please. You notice the inflection on kill me? I wonder if you could hear it just once again. <coughs> Mother, listen. They won't let me talk for long. These men are desperate. I don't know what they're asking, but give it to them. They're going to kill me. I know they're going to kill me. Help me, please. Well, there we are. I suggest to you, Lord Carvel, that this recording is one that you willingly made for your accomplices in this crime. Because you knew that at the time that it would be needed, you would be in the attic of your own home and therefore out of reach of the telephone. I thought I had been speaking... It is not the fact that you wanted your accomplices to use this recording to provide you with an alibi. No. To prove that you couldn't be in the attic at the time that you were in the attic. I thought I... it's only the discovery of that recording that has made your story and your alibi useless. I thought I had been speaking to my mother. Lord Carvel, there was some building work on the kitchens of Shotley Hall in April and May of last year, was there not? Yes. And your estate manager told you, did he not, that one of the windows would have to be wired into the existing burglar alarm system. I, I believe he did. I, I'm not too sure on the details. But this wasn't done. 
Apparently not. Did you know that, Lord John? No, I was under the impression that it had been done. We know that three people entered the house by this kitchen window. Were you one of them, Lord Carl? No. If you had been, one of your prime considerations would have been that should you be discovered and have to retreat, you must not be recognised. Now, unless you had an accomplice who was also known at Shockley Hall, this would really only have applied to you, wouldn't it? So what would have been more sensible than for you to wear a mask? Could Exhibit 4 be held up, please? A stocking mask like that one. Have you seen that mask before, Lord Carl? No. It bears traces of hair similar to your own. Have you not, in fact, worn it? No. Absolute pack of lies. Shh. We know that the criminals went straight from the kitchen window to the attic. They uh, didn't have to look. They knew where to go. They didn't take a single wrong turn. It is surely inconceivable that they should have found their way so deftly. Well, they did. They did indeed, Lord Carl. Because you were there to guide them. No. From the kitchen window to the attic. No. And I suggest to you that at seven o'clock that evening, when the telephone rang, you knew it was the signal. You knew that your mother would have to go out of the library where the safe was in order to answer it. No. And I suggest to you that at that time, when she was at her most distressed, trying to raise money as she thought to save your life, you crept out of your hiding place with your accomplices and stole her money. No. The jury will decide, Lord Carvel. Whatever the jury decides, that is not what happened. Nevertheless, the jury will decide. Are you, um, are you still on good terms with Miss Amaryllis Roper? Yes. And yet we haven't seen her at this trial, have we? No. Oh, well, perhaps she's been on holiday. In Africa, perhaps. I don't think so. Hmm. At all events, uh, she was not at the trial at the, be at the beginning, but uh, I'm now given to understand that she's being called as a witness by the defence. <laughs> ah, well, perhaps your feeling for her was stronger than hers for you. There was no reason why she should have been here. She has nothing whatever to do with this, this affair. Well, she supported the KLF, didn't she? I believe she has some sympathies, yes. And was there not a motion in the Hove University Union attacking the imperialist interests of British industry in South Africa and the exploitation of the black proletariat? And was that motion not proposed by the president of the union, Miss Amaryllis Roper? Oh, no, it wasn't. It you was astound not. me, Lord Carvel. The speech I take it you out of fire. I know the speech which I'm referring to, and I have a report of that meeting here. I shall read you some extracts from that speech, as reported here, and perhaps you will see if you can recognise them. After a diatribe in which she says that British firms in South Africa and throughout the Third World are relics of British imperialism, and in which she refers to the Carvel family as the Carvel spider, she goes on to say, and that is why it is the duty of every principled person. Of every principled person to say yes to the KLF and no to British neo-imperialism in Africa. Socialist slut. I call Miss Emerilis Roper. Sebastian Carvel is not only the heir to the enormous Carvel International Corporation, to factories, sweatshops and plantations worldwide, but also to one of the most hated and despised names in black Africa. His family was responsible for alienating the natural wealth of the African people and were among the first to rip the rich heart out of the African earth. And for their imperialist profits in their mining enterprises, they exploited both black and white labour, determining the material conditions of the bitter rivalry between the two sections of the South African working class, and thus established the bedrock of apartheid. The Carvels have now left South Africa, that ravaged land, in the hands of their natural heirs, the white bourgeoisie, but their industrial empire has grown, spreading the family name abroad to sponsor exploitation of black nations. This is the way, spun with South African gold thread, which traps the black worker in the net of neo-imperialism. And in the middle of it all, here is the Carvel spider, represented today by our own homegrown aristocrat, imperialist and anthropologist, Lord Sebastian Piers Carey. And I suggest to him that if he comes to union meetings, 
he would be taxful to leave his title with his hat and coat in the hall. Now, Miss Rapper, at the time of Lord Carver's kidnapping, you were his mistress, were you not? Yes. Are you still? No. Now, it has been suggested in this court, Miss Roper, that you have sympathies with the KLF, the KwaZulu Liberation Front. Is that so? I have sympathies with them, yes, insofar as they represent the only hope for the black working class in Africa of any kind. Yes. I will not tolerate the use of the witness box as a platform. Confine yourself to answering questions. But if I'm going to be asked questions with political implications embodied in the answers, surely I'm allowed to explain a little. If the court requires an explanation, then you will be asked for one. Yes, go on. Mr. Rapper, you know the defendant well. Fairly. Do you know if he shares your views of the KLF? No, he doesn't. Not even through his affection for you? No. Does he share any of your beliefs? Political beliefs? Yes. No. None? No, none. He might appear to, to a reactionary, but he doesn't. And um, have you tried to convert him? <laughs> well, we've talked about things, and I've tried to explain my political beliefs to him, and things that I'm not allowed to explain to this court. Yes. Have you had any success? What do you mean, success? Well, I mean, has he started to agree with you at all? Oh, no, he was uh, far too filled up with the press and liberal claptrap and terrorists yes. and gunmen and thank innocent you, civilians. Lord Carville, remember, is a yes. peer of the realm. Yes, thank you, Miss Raper. It has been suggested that Lord Carville could undertake a crime such as the one has been described with the assistance of the KLF. It has been insinuated that you may have encouraged him in this. Well, that's inconceivable. In fact, it's impossible. Now, why is it impossible, Miss Roper? Because the KLF isn't like a golf club, where as long as you have enough money, you just walk in and join. <laughs> now, the KLF wouldn't want Lord Carville, and they don't accept any member of an occupying bourgeoisie. I mean, it would have been like Goebbels trying to join the French resistance. Oh, really? Yes. However, let me repeat, but it has been suggested that he might have done this with your assistance or due to some prompting from you. Is that so? Now, before you answer that question, I must advise you that you don't need to do so. You have a privilege not to answer any question which might tend to incriminate you. I don't need any privilege. And the answer to the question is no. If any serious militant group had been going to kidnap Lord Carville, they'd have kidnapped him, not messed about. Yes, Miss Roper, you seem to conceive your function here as some sort of advisor to this court on matters concerning revolution and international politics. This is not the case at all. You are here simply to answer questions put to you by counsel concerning this robbery and this alleged kidnap. And I would be most grateful if you would confine yourself to those matters. Yes, Mr. Parson? My lord. Uh, Miss Roper, could you tell the court if Lord Carver ever mentioned to you a plan to arrange his own kidnapping? No. Did he ever talk to you about stealing from his mother? No, he didn't. Did you ever suspect he had any plans or intentions of such a nature? No, and if he had, he would have mentioned them to me. Why do you say this? Because he knew that I would sympathise, even though I might have thought the idea rather grotesque. And so you were never aware of his being involved with any plot of any kind? No. Thank you, Miss Roper. No further questions, madam. Miss Roper, you sympathise with the KLF? I have said so. You sympathise with terrorist activities? I have reservations. Similar organisations in Mozambique and Rhodesia have been responsible for the killing and mutilation of innocent yeah, people. We better hear this. Women, children, do you support that? I said I have reservations. Reservations won't serve many lives or limbs. And did you support American I will bombing? Ask the question. Look, for political reasons. I am not on trial, Miss Roper. And nor am I. And perhaps you should be, Miss Roper. Yes, Mr. exactly. Yes. Perhaps she should be. That's what. Lady Carvel. You must remain silent, you understand? And I will tolerate no further demonstration from the public gallery. Now, Mr. Fry, you've laid no foundation for that remark I think I heard. Very good, my lord. I think an apology, I my don't lord. I want an apology. You will get an apology, young woman, if I say you will. No, since you so desire. Well, let's get on. I put it to you, Miss Roper, that it is too remarkable a coincidence that you should support the KLF and that Lord Carvel should be involved in a plot with the same organisation, but that you should know nothing about it. 
the coincidence isn't in the least remarkable. There are a large number of students at Hove who feel the same way as I do. In fact, a large number all over the country. But they're not all one trust so deeply involved with Lord Carville. But Lord Carville is a student, and therefore he's liable to come into contact with all sorts of influences. Now, you've said that yourself and Lord Carville did not share political beliefs. Tell me, is it possible for anybody as highly politically motivated as yourself to have a relationship of the kind you had with Lord Carville without sharing political beliefs? Evidently it is. Now, we've heard that in your welcoming address to the Hove University Union, you attacked Lord Carville in a variety of uncomplimentary ways, at one point referring to him as a spider. Surely something must have changed your views to allow your related relationship to be possible. I refer to the business network all over the world, controlled by the Carville family as the Carville web. I did not refer to Lord Carville as spider. Now, forgive me, Miss Roper. And uh, in the middle of it, Spider Carvel waiting to it. That was the whole Carvel family, the large number of controlling corporations. Right, in thank it. you, thank you. You answered my question, Miss Roper. And you'd have the jury believe that you were prepared to enter that web without first taming the spider. I don't know what you mean. You know very well what I mean. You want the jury to believe that you were Lord Carvel's mistress, but that you, you did nothing that successfully changed his views. Our relationship was not a political one. Are you still Lord Carvel's mistress? No. Are you still on cordial terms? Yes. And yet you haven't attended his trial until today? No. Why not? I have a job. When did you terminate your relationship with Lord Carvel? After I visited his home last summer. Really? Why was that? Because it sickened me. I find it humiliating to be waited on by servants, and I felt such contempt and disgust. But surely I... you knew something of the background that Lord Carvel came from. Yes, it's one thing to know it. It's another to see it in action. Was Lord Carvel upset and you broke it off? If he was, he didn't show it. You know, this is most intriguing, Miss Roper. If you did, in fact, break off that relationship by that time, how is it that on the day that Lord Carvel claims to have been kidnapped, he was on his way to meet you? Well, we were still friendly. Oh, how often did you meet after you had broken it off? Not often. Well, how often? Once a week, once a month? Well, there how was often? no regularity once and or twice. Yet on this day of all days, and at this time of day of all times, he was going to meet you. What a coincidence. I put it to you, Miss Roper, that you were behind this entire plot. When you were down at Shotty Hall in the summer, was not that the ideal time to mention it to him? It would have been, but I didn't. Did you not remind Lord Carvel of his moral obligation to the oppressed black proletariat? No. Did you not act as liaison between Lord Carvel and the KLF, an organisation which, as you yourself have said, he would otherwise have found it very difficult to contact? If they had kidnapped him, they would have done it properly. Mr. Roper, I put it to you that you are the most significant factor in this case. And the part you have played in it is yet to be fully appreciated. No more questions, my lord. Parsons? That concludes the case of the defence, my lord. Very well. As counsel for the defence has concluded his case, you may leave the court. Yes. <laughs> may it please your lordship, members of the jury. On the 18th of November, 1930, <laughs> The police took from an abandoned car a tape recording of Lord Carvel's voice, a stocking mask, and a pair of plimsolls that matched prints found in this attic. The stocking mask and the plimsolls have been worn by somebody with the same blood group and the same hair as the accused. Fourthly, although this safe was, safe was carefully concealed, it was opened apparently with ease whilst Lady Carvel was on the telephone in another room listening to a tape recording of her son's voice. Now, Lord Carvel was the only person in the house besides his mother who knew about this safe. Fifthly, the accused is involved with Amaryllis Roper, who is a supporter of the revolutionary organisation that demanded the ransom, and an avowed hater of the Carvel interest in South Africa. Now, I put it to you that one of these points alone is sufficient to discharge the burden of proof on the prosecution. Cumulatively, they are damning. Members of the jury, I submit that the evidence points inexorably to a verdict of guilty and I ask you to bring in that verdict. May it please your Lordship, members of the jury, I'm not going to waste much of my time or of yours 
and discussing my learned friend's five damning points, the evidence contained in them is all circumstantial. I mean, we all know that there were many, many people familiar with the interior of Shotley Hall apart from Lord Carful. And it is laughable to suggest that by hiding a safe behind a row of false books that you render it burglar-proof. Any experienced criminal can seek out and find such a place without the aid of Lord Carvel. And we heard Mr. Ing go on and on about his sweat groups and his hairs, which added up to absolutely nothing. Nothing in his forensic evidence connected the defendant with any of the exhibited articles. I'm sure all these points are as familiar to you as they are to me, but what worries me much more in this case is the behavior of Lady Carvel. Now, Lady Carvel believed her son had been kidnapped. She went to the bank and got the money. When he telephoned her, she believed that he was in a state of terror. And when he returned to her, she was greatly relieved. But, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have watched Lady Carvel stand in that witness box and testify against her son. Now, what has changed her? Who has changed her? Was it the police? Remember, she is the only non-expert witness called by them, and without her, they have no case. Or was it her growing hatred of Miss Roper? Was it an idea to get revenge against her and her son, whose affections were more and more being directed towards Miss Roper? Whatever the reason, I believe that Lady Carver was the only reason that this case has been brought against her son. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I suggest to you that the prosecution has offered no proof, never mind proof beyond all reasonable doubt in either of these charges. And I am confident you will return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you. Members of the jury, as I'm sure you know, a person is guilty of theft if he dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. Now, you may think there is no doubt that a theft was committed, and the only question is whether or not the accused was party to that theft. And here you must ask yourselves whether the accused played a willing role in a faked kidnapping. For if he did, then you must remember that it is an offence to aid and abet an offence, as it is to give active assistance or encouragement at the time of the offence. Remember, the prosecution must prove their case beyond all reasonable doubt, and if you have a reasonable doubt, then your verdict must be not guilty. Remember to consider each count separately. You must ask yourselves whether the accused is guilty of theft, whether he is guilty of aiding and abetting a theft by persons unknown, or whether he is not guilty of any crime at all. Now, I would ask you to retire and to consider your verdicts. All stand. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict on which you're all agreed? We have. On the first count, do you find the defendant, Sebastian Piers Carey Carvel, guilty or not guilty? What did you expect? Lord Carvel was found guilty on the charge of theft and was sentenced to five years imprisonment. We shall be returning to watch another leading case in the Crown Court. <laughs>